Hi guys, welcome to Through the Roof Theatre Company's first of hopefully many more talks with professionals within the showbiz industry. I'm joined today by the legendary Claire Moore, who is a fantastic singer, actress and vocal coach. Hi Claire. Hello Aaron, it's so lovely of you to have me. Let's just give you a bit of background about how me and Claire sort of know each other. So, gosh, it must have been about 2000, 2001, maybe. We did a concert called Let's Sing at the Birmingham Symphony Hall. Um, I mean, we didn't know each other at all then. I was part of the Kids Ensemble and Claire was a featured artist. And it was hosted by the late John Savident and also featured Ronnie Corbett which as a kid for me, that was amazing. Like what an opportunity to meet these people. Um, and then fast forwarding uh, a little bit later on, we actually met up again at Peter Poikarpu's show in the West End. And that was Songs of My Life. Um, right. I was doing a little bit of running and you were, you were singing. I introduced myself during the tech rehearsal uh, just to say I had sort of worked with you before. But then that was kind of it for us, really. And then fast forwarding a little bit later, we've just kept in contact, which has been great. And now we've got to this point. Shall we kick start? Absolutely. Um, where are you originally from and how did this all start? Gosh, well, I'm from Bolton in Lancashire and my dad uh, actually was a jazz musician. He was a jazz pianist and had a trio and I have quite a, you know, um, a well-established career up in the Northwest. He used to do a lot of radio broadcasts and all sorts of things and work with some, some big names. And he was also musical director at a couple of well-respected nightclubs because variety was still a thing there. So I grew up really surrounded by music. And from, I think I was about eight, I probably had piano lessons. I was never very good. And no matter how much, how much I practiced, I was never really very good at, I, I, my facility only went so far, um, but I always wanted to sing. I, could, I just loved singing. And, uh, and it, when I was in my fourth year, I used to do lots of things at school and bits and pieces, but my English teacher was co-producing the school show with the music teacher and she auditioned me and it was um, the Pirates of Penzance and I played Mabel and that I was really love the before. Pirates of Penzance yeah well so do I now particularly and um so at that point my parents agreed for me to have singing lessons and I went to an amazing lovely local lady in Bolton called Margaret Lindsay I keep in touch with to this day and uh, started singing lessons and that was when I really knew that I wanted to do it seriously and from then I, I went to the Royal Northern and uh, studied sort of classically actually with the brilliant brilliant now sadly departed Joseph Ward who was the most amazing teacher and amazing also because he got me and um, he knew that I wanted to do other things so I loved all the classical stuff but my heart kind of lay elsewhere as well and he he got that and through it was a real support to me all the way through, which enabled me to kind of really think about a career in musical theatre, I suppose. I hadn't really thought about it. Wow. So actually, really, you, you've come from a very classical background and you kind of so sort of fell into it by accident, really. Yeah, I think I think probably because of my dad's musicianship. Um, and of course, there were also lots of music at any house parties remember those house parties. <laughs> yes um so and we just people would always there'd be music and singing so I kind of wanted to sing everything but I did love the the, the technical work of the classical stuff and when I was at music college I met um a percussionist who was also on the comp composition course a guy called Kevin Malpass and he and another guy writer Roy Mitchell wrote a, a musical Roy was I think still a student at Manchester Poly or might have just left by then and Kevin um, was still at college and Joe introduced me to them and said you should go and do some singing with them because it's your kind of music and uh, anyway I found myself playing the lead in the musical for Granada Television that was you know wow. so suddenly but it was really just being lucky as well because meeting people and working together not with an idea that oh one day I'll do this but just oh isn't this fun in the here and now and, and their new 
new music, you know, new writing, which is something that is really important always. You know, this was 1981 that this was aired. And for a it was and it was a nationwide TV show. So for the producers to take a chance on a couple of students writing a piece and commissioning them to come up with this new piece of musical theater, like a rock musical it was called Visiting Day. I don't know if you'll ever find anything. Oh, right. <laughs> Um, was a really brave thing to do for them uh, all that time ago. So, so I always sort of dibbled and dabbled in different things, and of course loved singing the jazz. Mm. And um, and then a group of us went up to the Edinburgh Fringe just after I'd graduated. A couple of ladies, Liz Kitchen, who's done a lot of ch writing for children's television, mm. and Kate Young, who was a wonderful musical director, a real trailblazer for the female musical directors that have followed in her footsteps. And sadly, she died recently, but she was amazing and a brilliant writer as well. And they wrote a musical, which we took up to the Edinburgh Fringe. And it was there really that I, I started to meet other people. And because of that, indirectly led to me meeting my agent and moving to London. I've never done the Ed Edinburgh Fringe. What's it like? Well, it's a long time ago. I mean, right, okay. <laughs> about 1982. So for us, you know, we've just graduated from music college. We, uh, Kate was from um, Edinburgh, actually. So we were all piled in her house and just having a ball, a bunch of kids, a bunch of mates. Let's put a show on. Let's do a show. And and it was it was just an amazing experience. And I've never been back since my daughter's been. And, uh, you know, when we get up and running again, I'd love to be able to go back up because I think it's really important to try and support these these things. And it would be a lovely nostalgia trip for me as well, because it will be, well, yes, a long time because next year will be, you know, a significant anniversary, won't it? If it's 82. So. Wow. that's All, those, all those years ago. Yeah, exactly. Years, I think it would be for us to visit Edinburgh Fringe because it would probably mean that we as a theatre company who are supporting new writing or works that aren't really out there, maybe we could find something that we could collaborate with some people with. That would yeah. be cool. Well, if I can do anything to help, count me in. No, I think oh, it's brilliant. I I'll think, hold you to that. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. You, you know, it, it, absolutely. I think it's it's a brilliant platform. Well, you think what's happened that, you know, even recently, you think of, of Six, for instance, absolutely. you know, and what an amazing success story for, for them. And, you know, a young pair of writers, and I mean, I know that is an extraordinary tale for them, but there are there are other people that come through and we really need to support our British writers, I think, as well. Oh, absolutely. A hundred percent. I mean, I've come across all sorts of little gems that are kind of just hidden away and you think, what is going on? Like, we need to get this out to a wider audience to educate people and say, look at all of these shows. I'm kind of glad that it's starting to do that with... Um, you know, things like Dear Evan Hansen, which probably at, at one point would never have had the opportunity it's had. And then like Six as well, all these new works are coming out and luckily they're, they're a hit with, a, with the audiences. Yeah. And I think that's something that we want to promote. We want to make sure that we can uh, support that as best we can. Yeah, well, I think that's brilliant to hear, you know, and it's, it's a really, I mean, it's hard for everybody at the moment, but it's particularly hard for for writers, I think, and, and writers of musical theatre, because, you know, you can write a, a, a one-man play or a two-man play, but as soon as you get into musical theatre, then you need music, and it, it immediately gets more expensive to do, and, um, you know, we've got some fantastic writers, you know, you think of Pippa Cleary and Jake Brunger, and, and their work that they've done, and everybody just slogging away, and the, I've done a couple of things for, um, Mercury music, you know, development and new stuff. And gosh, I can't remember how long ago, a few years ago, I did a song cycle um, called the Song Cycle for Soho, which was all new songs that we put together into a, a review. Sarah Travis was our MD and um, Simon Grief directed it. And it was four of us. And it was just a joy to come across completely new music. Um, in fact, Pippa and Jake had written one of the songs, Tim Sutton, uh, Douglas Hodge, were loads of people, you know, going into new and, and a young guy then, well, he still is, um, called Barnaby, uh, Barnaby Race. I don't know if you've heard of Barnaby. Barnaby wrote a brilliant song 
that uh, Neve Perry and I sang called um, Mummy Knows Best. And it was a bit of a kind of cougar song. It was hilarious. And I went to see Amelie uh, not that long ago. And he had done all the musical arrangements and completely reimagined it all brilliantly. And it was just so lovely to see him having some success after thinking, God, he's really special, you know, as a writer. And um, so it's it's great. So there are people out there and, and we need to give them the opportunities to get their work performed. And, you know, places like the National Youth Music Theatre and British Youth Music Theatre mm. are very good at, at um, developing new writing and, and new writers and mentoring them. And, you know, we just have to hope that these places can survive. I have faith that they will. I I, so. I believe so. I think, you know, our willingness and our kind of hunger to, to maintain the arts and like the new writings and things like that, you know, I think that's something that just doesn't go away. Mm. Um, so I've got I've got faith in that. I, I think um, I think we will see this. Yeah, well, I, I have too. And I'll tell you what, in a way, I kind of think that there is going to be a bit of a, a renaissance. It's going to be, I hope so, an, an opportunity for the young people to take us forward. When, when I say young people, I mean, you're you're very young to me. But I mean, the, the generation of, of my kids who were 24 and 26 and that age, which I think has had a really, really tough time for the last 12 months. I mean, I know everybody has, but, you know, when they should be forging their careers and forging relationships, at, uh, you know, a really important stage of their lives. And I think they'll be the ones to propel us into the future. And, um, you know, I hope that we can provide many platforms for that so yeah good for you i fully 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 trust that you will <laughs> fingers crossed um, right let's have a little delve into your um your career my murky path right. i'm so excited for this <laughs> um, you were part of the national theater weren't you and yeah. worked with the likes of ian mckellen and edward petherbridge yeah yeah well i, I was i was again it was an incredibly lucky way of that coming about because i hadn't done a formal dramatic training i'd always enjoyed the drama classes that we did as part of our um education at, at the royal northern but i never really had any formal training but I've had, I'd had a bit of experience by then because I did um, visiting day and then I did um, Victoria Woods talent at the Withenshaw Forum Theatre as it was then um, years and years ago just after that and um, so I'd had a bit of experience and I also did Camelot before I did any anything else um, yes. but then the National Theatre um, came about I was auditioned, I got a phone call from my agent and he said, oh, they want to see you for, um, was it called Music Theatre London? Nick Broadhurst was the director and Tony Britton was the musical director. And it was um, a company that put on operas, but they did it in a small scale and in a slightly more, I suppose, commercial way. Sometimes they would, um, fiddle around with it to, to make it work for a, a more modern day audience. So I had this audition for The Marriage of Figaro. I think it was for the Countess and uh, had a lovely time. And that was at the end of the day. And they said to me, oh, well, that was lovely, blah, blah, blah. But you're far too young. And, um, and we just sat down and had a chat. And I was saying, oh, you know, I've seen a few things that you do and I really like what you've done. But I said, I have a real issue with, that, I need to, that I need to talk to you about. And I said, I really don't like it when you change the keys of things I, I mean I'm not a purist at all I'm really not but that with regard to the the opera they're written so specifically for voices and I said you I think that you can't compromise on that and and you need to if you can't find somebody that can act it the way you want to you just need to look harder because there are singers out there who can sing it as it is and so we had this look and it was a really really lovely chat and it sounds like I'm digressing, but I'm not, honestly. So when, when I got home, back to my little flat in Clapham and pressed play on my reel-to-reel -reel answer phone, <laughs> it seriously was, there was a, a message from Richard, sorry, I'm just kicking my table, Richard, my agent, saying they want to see you at the National Theatre tomorrow. 
Wow. And it turned out that Nick Broadhurst, I hadn't realised, um, was one of the staff directors mm. at the National Theatre. And he'd heard that they were looking for a, a young, a new kind of young actress to play Felicity in The Real Inspector Hound. So I thought, oh my God, you know, what do I do? So I toddled off to the National. And uh, in those days, Thelma Holt was head of casting. Now, I don't know if you know who Thelma Holt is, but this powerhouse mm. of, a, of a woman, terrifying to most people. And I just, but, but me, because I was so sort of, it really was a case of ignorance is bliss and sort of went in and just had a chat with what I thought was this lovely lady who just, and I walked in and she went, oh, what a breath of fresh air. You're not wearing black. That was the... <laughs> <laughs> And so we had a chat and she said, Harry should come about. And, and I said, well, I haven't really got anything, you know, because it's very early in my career. I haven't really done very much. Ooh, panic, panic, panic. And she said, don't worry. Why don't just bring, bring us, learn a sonnet, find a sonnet and just bring a sonnet right. and, and have a read. Because I'd really like um, with Tom Stoppard and mm. Edward Petherbridge and Ian McKellen, I'd really like them to see you. So you know, come back in a few days. So I went, I went away and learned, found a son, sonnet and learned it and went into this room with, you know, Ian McKellen. Ian McKellen's from Bolton. Right. And Tom Stoppard, who I'd studied, you know, for my A-levels and just in a room with these people thinking, this can't be true, can't wait to tell my mum. And so I read my sonnet and then they, they asked me to read. And uh, they were just so lovely to me, to be honest. I didn't, I didn't really know or care what the outcome was. I just thought that experience alone was was something to cherish, yeah. you know, having been in, in the room with these people. And blow me if I didn't get offered the job. And wow. I mean, it, it talk about, you know, the, the paddling going on under the water because back then, and this was um, 82, when would it be 83 it was just after little shop actually um so 84 85 yeah that's when it would have been um it was run slightly different so each there, there were repertory companies within the national theater which is not the way it's done now and, and this was when peter hall was at the helm so richard Eyre had his own company um and and then and ian and um Edward had a whole company, so there were a company of one team of actors. So it was um, Sheila Hancock. Wow. Um, yeah, Ed, and, and Edward and Ian were, were acting within that. So Sheila, Edward, Ian, Eleanor Braun, um, Hugh Lloyd, oh, I'm trying to think, wonderful people, Selena Cadell, Julie Legrand, um, Oh, just an extraordinary bunch of people. Roy Kinnear, I mean, what a wonderful man and a wonderful actor he was. And then me. <laughs> oh, my God, you know. And, uh, oh, it was Greg Hicks. Oh, just uh, incredible, incredible team of people. And somehow I'd find my, find myself in the thick of all of this. And so because we were working in rep properly we didn't do that kind of four days on and four days off you'd be rehearsing for the next play all the time um which was which was brilliant so for me it was that was my drama school education really because they I just had to find a way of keeping up and um I, and it was just brilliant and we did the real inspector hound um, and with that, we did the critic, we paired it with the critic and Sheila directed the critic. And I think she was the first female director at the National. Brilliant. brilliant. Yeah, she was brilliant. So that whole year we did uh, the Duchess of Malfi uh, and, and then we did the, the most beautiful production of the Cherry Orchard in what was then the Cottesloe Theatre that Mike Alfreds directed. Uh, that was just extraordinary. We were just in a white voile box and then props on and off as necessary because Mike's one of the, you know, he had the shared experience theatre company and his method of working was if 
there was a lot of freedom within it, but very specific to the text. If something was mentioned in the text, that had to be absolutely observed. So the, the, the things I learned through working with him, and I played Anya in the Cherry Orchard, which I think is, I'm so proud to, to have played that role. God, um, how all those, years, all those years ago, and just, oh, it was it was just a glorious year. And, and every time I even walk in that building, even if I'm just meeting a mate for a coffee, I, I, I just love that place. I it must be really place. nostalgic, like how lovely, like to go in and think, you know, I, I was a part of this place. Yeah, how yeah. Wonderful. and it was a long time before I, I went back, you know, I went back then many years later with um, London Road and then with Follies. So it, it is, I think it's probably my favorite. I, I think I'd, I'd be happy to, one syllable at the National Theatre equates uh, many things for me, you know. Where did you train, Claire? The Royal Northern in Manchester, Northern. yeah. Right. Well, College of Music. So, you know, it was, a, uh, I think a lot of music colleges now are, have much more um, diversity in terms of their, their courses, but, you know, we, it was a, quite a classical place. Right. Apart, from, okay. apart from my students' mate, um, mate, my student mates, and we kind of um, broke, bent, bent the rules, I think. Excellent. Bit. I mean, it's really lovely to hear that, you know, you've gone from your training and then you're still learning on the job really you're and always learning though aren't you the deep end there like that's that's not an easy transition for any well, it's, it's, it's not and and it was and what I loved about it I found it very hard sometimes but I also loved the fact that nobody nobody treated me differently great so if I was given a note that was fine but if I if I was given any praise I really felt I'd earned it uh you know so there were times when I, I would be sl I'd be terrified and think I'm out of my depth and I can't do this. And, you know, even having to put on a posh accent, as I, I, I would be, there would be some words that I just used to think, oh, my God, I can't, I just can't say things. But you've got, you've got all the help at the National. If you need to talk to somebody, if you need to go over some lines or have some vocal coaching, uh, dial dialect coaching, whatever it is, there are people there to nurture you and, and and help you, you know, and not give you steps up or anything like that, but you know, the, it's just a wonderful establishment. I absolutely loved every single second there and learned so much, I owe them everything really. Um, let's take a little look into some of your musicals. Yes. So exciting. Um, so you mentioned Camelot, which I believe you played with Sir Richard Harris. Is that yes. right? Yes. Yes. Well, that was my and that was my first West End job. I saw an ad um, in the stage, in the actual paper mm. of the stage, and um, and thought, oh, okay. Well, I'll go along, and I took a mate down to play the piano, and. Um, Went, to, went along to the Phoenix Theatre, which is another theatre that I hadn't been in then for years till we did The Girls. So again, all these things tally up. And um, and I went down and I think I sang, my man's gone now from Porgy and Bess, as you do for a musical theatre audition and something else, I don't know what. And they were absolutely lovely. Uh, Michael Rubman was directing and uh, and they, they came out and said, oh, you know, well done, really enjoyed that but they obviously knew I was very young and said, do you have an equity card? And you needed a full equity card in those days to perform in the West End. And I said, I've got a provisional equity card, but I don't have a, a full equity card. And um, they said, oh, well, Marie calls her on Tuesday. This was Friday. Um, so if you can get an equity card, you can come back. You know, and I had no agent or anything then. So mm. I went back on the train, back home and um, rang equity, expl explained the situation. And because I've done a couple of things, because I've done the telly and I've done the Withenshaw Forum, they said, okay, there'll be a full equity card on the desk waiting for you on Tuesday morning. Amazing. So I picked it up, got on the train, went back down to London, sat at the Phoenix Theatre, all day long, everybody coming and going and coming and going. And at the end of the day, still sitting there. I mean, I've been sitting there for about six hours, you know, going, okay, well done. And the, Peter Roper, the company manager, then came out and said, 
who are you and why are you here? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I'm so naive, honestly. And I said, oh, well, I'm, I'm Claire Moore and I was here on Friday and you said if I could get a full equity card that I could come back. So I have, I mean, it never occurred to me to tell anybody, you know, um, so I have. And so he went, okay, hang on a minute. And he went in, everybody was packing up to go home, Aaron. It was hilarious. <laughs> the, the whole creative team, they were they all had like their, their bags over their shoulders. And they and they all sat down and, and let me in. I think they were just so, I think they were so impressed really that I'd actually managed to get off my ass and go and get one of these things and actually sort it out. And uh, and I got the job. It was lovely. And I was in the ensemble, which I was absolutely thrilled to bits about. And then once we started rehearsals, we were auditioned within the company. And um, that was when I was given the part of, of Nimue. So I had a, you know, first West End job and I had a lovely little featured role and a beautiful song, which people don't really know the song, Follow Me, you know. And she lures Merlin off and, um, I'm up a upper 20 foot ladder in some sort of green parachute silk and a weird <laughs> wing being wheeled on and off. Technology wasn't what it what it is now <laughs> back in those days. But on the same stage as Richard Harris, who spoke to us and was nice and gave us presents and was he, oh, you know, and was and was very difficult, but not but not to <laughs> us. And, um, you know, and I made lifelong friends, you know, Robert Meadmore, who played Sir Lancelot, is a really, really close mate of mine. And we've recently been doing some cabarets together over the last few years. It's only taken us wow. 30 years to get around to it, you know, but just, it was just lovely. And uh, a thrill for me to actually think that I was part of something like that. Let's talk a little bit about Little Shop of Horrors. Like this is one of my favorite shows. I mean, I'm a massive fan of Alan Menken anyway, which I'm sure- Yeah, he well, uh, who isn't? I mean, that man, <laughs> man is a I genius. He, uh, is, he is a genius. I've just recently been watching the, um, um frozen documentary too you know and all of that the, i mean i know that's not him but just, and i've got to watch his documentary about howard as well that's the one thing i haven't watched yet but all of these things and the way that he's gone into that that world and you just realize how blooming difficult it is it's not at all like you think it's going to be is it scrap the song scrap the songs but if anybody can do it alan can because he can write anything in any style and he's a delightful man as well um but of course i hadn't even heard of little shop of horrors back then all i did was once again see a picture of these kind of spindly legs and an advert in the stage and the ad said do you have what was it do you have the voice of barbara streisand the legs of betty grable i think it was the body of marilyn monroe i can't remember what it was um if so we want to see you for this show and uh, so I wrote a letter to Cameron McIntosh as you do saying dear Cameron McIntosh I've just seen your advert in the stage asking if you've got blah 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 I don't have any of those attributes <laughs> but I still think you should see me and so got a phone call <laughs> my mum answered the phone and said well Claire there's somebody on the phone from Cameron McIntosh's office. And, oh, wow. And, uh, <laughs> it, it invited me to go down and audition. And I think at the time that I saw that ad, I think they were struggling to, to be able to get Ellen Green to come over from America to play the role because, you know, equity and the, the role exchanges and, and all of that have been, become much more sensible um, over the years. And uh, so I think at the time when the ad went in, it was to play the role, which of course I would never have had a chance at because I just didn't have enough experience. But by the time I got down for the audition, they were looking for her cover. Right. Which and I didn't know and I didn't care I, anyway. I didn't know what they were looking for. I just thought it was so, it just sounded so fun. So I uh, pitched up and uh, and I, I sang a song from... Um, Oh, the Streisand and Chris Christopherson, A Star Is Born. I oh, sang everything. Wow. I don't know if you know that song. It's a beautiful song. In fact, that whole score is Great. full of brilliant audition songs, actually, um, as well. And so I sang everything from there. And uh, 
on stage, but they were at a table on stage as well. And they said, oh, come a bit closer, come a bit closer. So I went in and then sang and belted my head off and had a lovely time. And they were like, oh, OK. And um, <laughs> and then sent, sent me off to, to look at some... Um, some scripts said how's your American accent and I, I and I said oh oh it's all right yeah where, where you know what where you, New, New York California what and went, oh it's fine just a general American so I was up in the loose practicing this thing having you know never really done an American accent in my life apart from for a laugh and um I went back downstairs and and read and then it felt I was living in um I moved down to Ealing um, shortly after that to be with a bunch of old schoolmates and um, we were waiting by the phone for what felt like days and days and days you know um, in this freezing cold house in, in Ealing all earning no money you know and uh, so when the phone rang every time the phone rang we'd all gather around whoever it was for um, and suddenly, and suddenly, and I got offered the, the job of cover, put the phone down. It was like a big party in the house, ringing wow. my mom saying, guess what? And uh, and that that was incredible because I, I didn't get, well, I didn't really get any rehearsal because, um, you know, time's always tight. There's always loads to do. Uh, but I, so I just watched, I just watched and would make notes and, you know, um, and Ellen bonkers, but extremely sweet to me. Um, and um, and then in previews, she went off off ill. So we opened on the Tuesday, and on the Saturday matinee, I, I got a phone call saying Ellen's off. Yeah, exactly. Oh. Um, and so, and you're you're on. I'd never been on stage. I didn't have my own clothes. I didn't have my own wig. I had nothing. Um, but I think such is the. Um, as I say, the, the, the ignorance of youth in a way. I, I kind of almost didn't have time to realize what a big deal it was. So I just got in and uh, they talked through everything. And, uh, you know, everybody, it was a small company. There was only so many places on stage you could be. Mm. Uh, I, I kind of thought I knew what I was doing, more or less. I think I thought I knew my lines because I'd been doing my homework. And, um, and the next thing I know, I was being sort of pushed on stage and, and we were off, you know, and everybody was just like, if I was in the wrong place, they'd work around me. Nobody was bothered. It's just like, let's get this show on. So it was a brilliant, you know what it's like when, if you go on for the first time as, a, as an understudy. Oh, yes. The whole, company, <laughs> you know, the whole company focuses their entire performance on you. They're so selfless. It's brilliant. And somehow got me through it. And unbeknownst to me, that night, Joanna Lumley was in the audience. I did both both shows on the Saturday, and on the Saturday night, Joanna Lumley was in the audience. And in those days, she did um, she had a, a diary page, a diary column in the Times, and um, and on the her following diary page, she devoted the whole column to my performance and having gone to see Little Shop, and how. Um, you know, we were still in preview, so obviously the poor girl had had no rehearsals and, you know, wonderful. She was just, just lovely. And on the strength of that, I got called into Cameron's office and, and offered the takeover. I mean, it was, it was incredible. I mean, it's such a good role, isn't it? You know, I think one of the songs um, which she sings in the show, Somewhere That's Green, it's, oh. such, it's such a brilliant song, you know, and it really tugs brilliantly at the heartstrings um, yeah. you know, just the way it's written you know she's talking about all these things that she loves and that what she wants to go on and do and you know or who she wants to be with and you know as an audience member that she in her head thinks she's never going to get there and you know you you really bond with her don't you I think that yeah, there's something do. magical and, I think, and it's also it's just so brilliant because Howard's lyrics I mean they're writing together as a team I think he's, he's almost unsurpassed in musical theatre you know um, and and what was so brilliant about those lyrics you know you think that she's dreaming for what she thinks is the world and actually her aspirations are so very ordinary mm -hmm. she just wants a picket fence and a, a disposal unit in the and just to be able to watch telly and sit and hold hands with her with her hobby and just want just an, an ordinary life and it's so touching and 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 yet 
it is very touching without being sentimental because they undercut it with the the wit of uh, their their superb clever writing you know it's just it's brilliant it is lovely can i take us now on to um probably one of the shows that you are so very well known for phantom of the opera how did that come about well yeah well uh, well again you know i have a lot to thank cameron for and after after little shop that was when i then went off to the national and um while i was there um i was invited to audition for this new show you know by then I had an, an agent which was was brilliant I, I got my agent the wonderful Richard Grenville back in uh when just after I'd started in Little Shop I was working on Little Shop um when I when I went with Richard and um so he gave me a call and said oh they want to see you because I think Cameron knew as well that I'd had a classical training even though he'd only heard me do a bit of wellying in um <laughs> little shop but knew knew what my background was and um so I went in for this audition and uh I think I I, I sang O mio babino caro I think because I knew that was one of Andrew Lloyd Webber's favorite arias so talk about creeping um <laughs> but I thought well why not um and I knew they wanted to, and I think I probably popped out a bit of poor wandering one as well because why not and uh and they asked me to stay behind and gave me some music to look at. No, I mean, there was no piano to go and practice. After instance, I just went and sat in a corner and thought, OK, um, and have a look at it. And, and it turned out that they, one was a bit of wishing and one was a bit of think of me. Right. And went back down and, and sort of bluffed my way through a little bit of both of those. You know, and how Prince was there and, and Cameron. It was, you know, auditions were different then as well, you know. That you didn't really have casting directors in the room. It was your director, your musical director, the producer, and they were hobnob and your choreographers and everything. Everybody hobnobbed together, and um, went in and sang a bit, a bit of those. And um, we knew, I think, that it was for the alternate because I'd never really heard that expression, particularly. But I think um, Elaine had had an alternate in Evita, mm -hmm. so it was quite a new thing in those days and um so i you know did did my bit everybody was very nice and uh and then got offered this incredible i mean had no idea what this was going to turn into you know and um and so you know ended up in an amazing company of people in this extraordinary piece of musical theater and back in what was almost like the British heyday of the big musical theaters um, pieces, you know, I don't think it, it was such a phenomenon. There really hadn't been anything like it um, for a, a long, long time. And of course, you know, what was so beautiful about it in a way was because Andrew had written it for Sarah. So there was a whole other level of love in the writing of it and it was such a joy to be part of I mean it, it, it was tricky because once again didn't have any rehearsals and then we, I mean you couldn't you couldn't make this up but we opened on the Tuesday for previews and guess what I was on on the Saturday oh my god <laughs> wow now, having, having had you know having had the experience in in little shop I made damn sure that I knew what I was doing and yeah. I mean I, I had a piano in in my little flat and uh so I I would just practice myself because uh, you know I wasn't always welcome in the rehearsal room either so I didn't really get to watch any rehearsals till we went into tech and um and when I went on uh you know I had no costumes no wigs I had nothing again and uh so the right on I was in watching on the Friday night uh, of the previews and thinking oh Sarah sounds great you know toddled off home following morning company manager Bob West rang me and said okay Sarah's off and what we're going to do is we're going to rehearse you today so it's that Saturday and you're going to go on on Monday so I said oh, okay okay so in I went Oh, my heart. Oh, God. I mean, I can it, talk about automatic recall, flipping it. And um, went in and I'd already made the decision whilst, whilst travelling in 
that if I could get through the rehearsal in the afternoon, I was going to go on in the evening because I just thought I will just, I won't be able to cope with then having to wait on all Sunday and go on on Monday. So I, I just said, look, you know, if I get through today, I'll do tonight. Cause I thought as well, you know, why cancel two shows if you only need to cancel one. And uh, with the help of everybody else, I mean, again, you know, everybody was, oh my God, Claire's on. Yeah. Everybody was, was focused on getting me through um, the wonderful Steve Barton, uh, who played Raoul, who just held my hand literally every step of the way, Mary Miller, Janet Devonish, all the amazing company. And then of course, Michael Crawford, who was so generous. Um, Cause you can imagine I'm standing in the wings, just about to go on a show that a world premiere of a show that had had so much hype that had only done sort of four performances, everybody going to see Sarah Brightman. And then they make the announcement that due to the indisposition of Sarah Brightman, the place was in an uproar. Oh, really? And I'm standing, yeah, cool. oh God, yeah. Boo. No. Oh, oh my God, the groans of disappointment. Oh. And, um, we're just about and, to go on. The, you know, and, and, and Rosie Ash, uh, who I didn't mention previously, holding on to my hands, going, you'll be great, you'll be great, you'll be great. You know, just adorable, all these amazing people. Um, and, uh, and of course you walk on stage and you've got to bear in mind that people, didn't even know the show then. So if you think of Think of Me, where you start off being a bit rubbish, um, <laughs> and only only to then develop into the operatic diva, and uh, so so you start off, you know, think of me, think of. And so the, the audience probably all sitting going, oh my oh, god, who the are. hell is this terrible person? But what's brilliant is by the time you get to the end of Think of Me, I mean, you you've got them where you need them because you know I the cadenza and all of that. I mean, it was just wonderful. You're on stage, you're on your own in this scenario, playing the situation that you're in. Um, and it was just absolutely incredible. The only person I had in the audience that I knew was, was my agent, because I just said, you've got to be here because if it all goes wrong, you can explain why. And if it all goes right, then we can enjoy the moment together. And, um, and at the end of the show, it, it was just extraordinary. And Michael Crawford insisted on me taking the last bow. You know, can you imagine? Lovely. So he went on and then he, he brought me on. And I mean, honestly, I could burst into tears thinking about it, but the whole place just rose as, as one. It was, it was really extraordinary. It was really extraordinary. And, and at the end, there was a lady at the stage door who came around. She came around and she said, I have to tell you that when they announced that Sarah was off, I was one of the people that was thinking, I'm going to go and get my money back, which is what they, you know. And she right. went to the box office and box office and said, you are fully entitled to your money back. Absolutely. But please go and watch the show. If you don't enjoy it, then we'll give you your money back and you can come again. And she told me that story and just said how much she'd enjoyed it. And oh, it was just... It was just lovely. It really was lovely. And uh, and that was the start of that, really. So another show where I ended up going on with, with no rehearsal, but you, gosh, you know, that year at the National paid dividends. Yeah. <laughs> I've had the experience. I know what to expect now. I mean, yeah, well, I just knew that I could come up with something, you know. Oh, absolutely. I think you do in those moments, don't you? Like, I think you can prepare so much, but then as soon as you're on the stage, you're like, oh, wow, now now I'm living it like it's a very yeah. different experience um yeah. and the dancer that you sang in think of uh, in think of me um is different to Sarah Brightman's isn't it was it really yes it is I, well the, the very nature of a cadenza is that it, it's an extension of, of of you doing something that you know most most opera singers had their own cadenzas at the end of arias and things that were that were sketched out and they you know in the early days would work with them with the with the composer and um and i just didn't feel that the cadenza sarah sang necessarily suited me and i thought it would be nice to have our own different thing but it didn't affect anything orchestrally you know you're on your own and so i i worked out my own cadenza and you know which was much it was a bit more runny and then there's a high d at the end of it and um and so honestly, I wish I'd negotiated a royalty. 
a, a penny that would have been fine i'd have been a very rich lady and and it's lovely because actually that's that's become the cadenza that they tend to use now it's probably my preferred version of the cadenza actually i just love it it's just it goes from such like what you would call it, like a safe space and then all of a sudden it takes you right up into the rafters and you're like wow like and it's such it's so impressive like it's, oh, it's, it's magic and it's it's nice it's nice to sing it i mean there were times when i used to think oh god have i actually got a top d well we'll find out here goes you know <laughs> um but uh, it, it was it was fun to sing and also i just thought you know by the time we get to that moment that she kind of knows that Raoul is sitting there. She's had this whole experience and, and gathered her confidence throughout. That there's something really lovely about it, it being a little bit of a tease, you know, the and you don't know what's coming, and, and off it off it goes. And um, I just it was just lovely. It was lovely to be able to flex the old vocal folds really as well in a role like that because I hadn't I hadn't done any classical singing from from leaving music college you know so not really I mean obviously I'd kept it up and enjoyed doing some stuff but I hadn't actually sung anything like that on stage so it was the best of both worlds for me because it really used the dark lower part of my voice which I was never afraid to use anyway and with the more poppy and jazzy stuff I, I um, always enjoyed accessing and then also pinging out the soprano stuff so it was just it was beautiful I loved it I loved it I'd, I'd still be there now really you'd have to zip two frocks together but I mean <laughs> <laughs> in fact there's a really great recording of you and I think it's John Barrowman um which is absolutely brilliant um I might actually leave a little link um in the description box below Ooh. actually I've always loved Phantom. I just think there's something so magical about it. It's gorgeous. Any challenging moments that you found were like really difficult um, to conquer, like playing the role of Christine? Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, always just making sure, you know, that first, that first song, Think of Me, you know, if you if you muck that up, you're stuffed really. So I always, <laughs> always had to make sure I was, I was on it and I, I carry my descant recorder with me everywhere which I've had from I've had from my school days which is over there still and I used to just do a little warm-up because of course I'd have pitch then so I don't you know G A B flat and I'd warm up and do my cadenza if I could do my cadenza I kind of knew that I was all all right because if I felt confident in that then somehow I, I would find the stamina. But it was it was a big thing and it was also emotional and it was just making sure that you were always you know the the technical side of thing didn't get away of, of the, the acting side of it. Cause at the end of the day, it was still text first, text first, act, you know, the acting first, but you, but you still had to make a, a, a lovely sound. And then the last 20 minutes of the show, I think when we get into past the point of no return from there on through to the end was just exhausting as a scene because it was all over the place. It was quite physical. You'd be on the floor, you'd be, you know, you know, trying to untangle yourself from that blooming veil, <laughs> trying to keep your wig on your head, which once didn't work, and I pulled the veil off, only to find that my wig was attached to it. So I remember sticking, <laughs> back, sticking back on my head and being very dramatic while I strode off into the wing and kind of fiddled around and got the thing back on my head. But I mean, in terms of the challenges, it was just, you know, you just had to be, be sure that you were match fit for it all the time. You know, because it was a big thing to be doing, well, six shows a week, because thankfully I, I had an alternate as well. But it was a beautiful thing. And in some ways, for me, it, I found it easier than sometimes doing the, the belty stuff, because you create your own acoustic, you know, when you're singing in a, a more legit style, I suppose. Um, but yeah, the whole, and just getting through from beginning to end, um, and, and trying to, as I say, trying to stay match fit, you know, so I, I, it was wonderful, but you had to be a little bit of a nun in your life to, to make right. sure that you, you were okay. But you know, that, that's what you do, isn't it? Oh, you know, it was great. You, that's part of you, isn't it? You are your business. Yeah. So you have to take care of yourself and make sure that, like you say, you are fit and ready to take that role on. When I was doing Phantom, I lived, um, I lived on my own anyway. I don't, 
rented a little flat on my own. And although I had a friend who, who stayed with me a lot, she was often out on tour. So I was able to take it easy and, um, you know, not, I wasn't, I had a lovely time, don't get me wrong. And I had a very, a very uh, interesting and fun social life. I, but, but you know, the, the job had to come first, for sure. I believe you were stolen away by Cameron once again to go and feature in Miss Saigon. Yeah, I mean, how amazing was that? So while I was still in um, Phantom when they started workshopping this new show uh, by the writers of Les Mis and... Um, and Cameron asked me to just take part in, in the workshops really, because I think they, they were looking for the Chris. They were looking for Chris and they said to me, will you, will you come and do a bit of Ellen in, in this workshop, see if we can find the guy. And of course it was, it was lo lovely for me um, to, to go and do a bit of belting again and, and do something different, but it, and it kind of went on for months and months. I had all these different blokes come in playing Chris. And eventually, uh, uh, Richard, my agent, had to ask and say, well, what's actually happening? Have you, have you, have you cast Ellen? And they went, well, oh, it's Claire. Didn't we sort of tell you? It was, you know what I mean? It was one of <laughs> so, oh, okay. Oh, well, thanks very much. Well, lovely. So, so I did, it was lovely, really. I mean, how lucky again, you know, I left one show knowing that I was going to go into another. And I had, um, I think I had a three month break or something. I mean, you know, it's just perfect. And it was, it was good in a way because after having done Phantom, I needed a bit of time to, to readjust where my voice was coming from right. for Ellen. Because even though she's not on much, when she's on, she's, she, it's a big thing. I mean, um, the, the duet with, with Kim, I still believe, I just think he's beautiful. Oh, it's, and, uh, you know, but, but I only really had that and then it's her or me or now that I've seen her or whatever you want to call it, because it went through so many different incarnations. But, you know, both of them were, were big things. Um, so it, it took a while to kind of get that into my voice. I say they were big things. And then you kind of listen to Leia, who made it all sound effortless because she was so brilliant. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> You know, she really, she really was. And so that was, you know, and then just went, went into rehearsals for that with, again, another amazing company of people and the brilliant Nick Heitner coming in to direct a musical. He was, and he was great. And he always used to join in in the warm ups in the morning. And, and I've never seen a less coordinated body, but it was of, of art, feet and arms all over the place. But he just, he was one of the team, you know, and, and led by example then, it was, it was brilliant. I remember my mum telling me she went to go and see it and she said she just could not get over the spectacle of seeing a helicopter on stage. You know, I, it, it's so revolutionary in, in so many different ways, like a, a, a wonderful, wonderful production. Drury Lane stage, is absolutely vast it's vast and it's as deep from front to the back of the stage as the auditorium is front to back of the auditorium oh, it's so huge and they used the full depth and width of the stage it was just this big black box really with all these craters god knows how the dancers survived um but just <laughs> this huge huge space um of things then flown in and brought in from the wings um and not that much wing space by comparison, you know, but this huge depth. So it was incredible to see that space, that expanse. And you really got, I mean, I think that the way that the overture sets up the mood of the piece when it starts, I just, he's brilliant. Bill uh, Bronze orchestrations, just stunning. And the, the whole mood was set within five seconds of the piece starting. And also, um, your the the song Ellen's song um now that I've seen her it's changed um they've, oh, they've yes taken it out um you know there there must be some reasons for that but I I listened back to the original recording and I I still have a love for that song um do you do you know roughly why they may have changed it or I don't I don't I I don't know what it what it was it, it and it changed even before, um, now that I've seen her, or it's her or me, whichever one, yeah. there was a song before that that we started 
with when it was being rehearsed, um, which was called What If He Doesn't Come Back Home Tonight, which was a bit more of a kind of country feel. Um, to it. What if he doesn't come back home tonight? Da, 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 dee, 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 dee. And it went on, uh, you know, um, and Nick Heitner said to me one day, he said, what do you think of your song? Or what are you supposed to say to that? <laughs> so I, so I said, Why? Because I thought I'm not I'm not gonna get myself in trouble here. And he said, Well, I don't really like it. I'm going to get them to write you a new one. Because and that was that. So wow. um I I always loved now that I've seen her as a lyric rather than it's her or me because I th always felt that was a bit confrontational and now that I've seen her I think it was for me in, in the the characterization which she wasn't a wonderfully fleshed out character so you had to make do with what you got and now that I've seen her for me was made me understand what that relationship had been and I think you know when we came to the end and and she took on little Tam mm because of because of that I think there, there had to be some empathy there so I always preferred that rather than it being a big confrontational thing because then you have this big sort of moment and then Chris and John come back on and then you have another row and just before she sings her song uh, Kim's been in and they have a row and if you're not careful it just all felt a little bit one-dimensional where we shout at this person and then then she shouts at me and then I sing a song about being angry and then they you know so um I always preferred those lyrics and I still can't remember which ones then went on the album and I think there are very even now there are various versions of it mm. and I think I sang about three different versions when we recorded the album and then they cut it all together maybe they just decided to find something that was more tailor-made for their new Ellen you know and um so I don't know I, I missed it uh I, for me and I think it's probably because I'm I'm too close to the show in a way. It, it felt like a show that uh, a song that didn't belong in that show, right. but I think that's probably just me because you know, it, you you kind of I'm I'm only a custodian. I I didn't own any part of it, but um, but I did miss it. I like them both for different reasons, but I think there's just something about the first song that just. I just yeah. really well, I think the solution is that she needs both songs. Yes. <laughs> That's what we need to do. Let's That's make cool. Ellen... Cut some other let's give, Stick some more. Give Ellen two solos. <laughs> there you go. That, that's definitely the solution to that problem, I think. <laughs> give her more to do. Uh, yeah, but it, but it was great. I mean, that, that just a, a, a wonderful uh, part of, you know, theatre history, again, you know, to, to be involved in. And, uh, you know, all these these people from different parts of the world and the thrill for them. And I still think one of the best moments ever was our final rehearsal in the rehearsal room before we, we went to the stage. So there were no costumes, no, no sets, no, no helicopter, nothing. Just, you know, in the, in the rehearsal room. And the moment where the fence comes in I think that was probably all we had a pretend fence and the helicopter would have come down and I was watching that bit of course because I wasn't in it and just the the commitment and oh it was just brilliant because you didn't need it worked with nothing and you knew then that okay with everything else it did it kind of is a shame that it became about the helicopter actually I, I'd love for people to have had the opportunity to see it without because it was almost more moving right. because people the actors the playing that desperation and some of them had kind of known really tough times as well um had come from difficult backgrounds in the in the philippines or wherever you know sending money back to families and you know we didn't right. realize how easy we had it um and that absolute 100 percent commitment was just breathtaking it really was just a, an amazing experience all round. I think it was in 2012, I may have this, um, you featured as a soloist at the BBC Proms singing um, one of the songs from the James Bond films. Oh, 
yeah, yeah. Well, it, it was a Friday night is music night actually, um, and and it was the first. I think it was the first Friday night is music night that was televised. It was several of the James Bond themes actually, so it was Amazing. absolutely glorious with their huge, wonderful orchestra singing Diamonds Are Forever and Goldfinger and just all those amazing, amazing songs. Yeah, I had a ball with that. I, d I wouldn't have been able to get the date. Was that when it was? Wow. I, I think uh, as far as my research goes, yes. Um, I mean, Fair enough. I was, um, I mean, it says that it was with the London Philharmonic Orchestra. Now that sounds to me, breathtaking like what is the what's the experience like singing with an orchestra like that oh, oh, oh. The, the, it's it's absolutely brilliant it's absolutely brilliant. And again you know back in the in the 80s and early 90s we were so blessed and particularly at the BBC I did a lot of work for the BBC when I was um doing Phantom and, and Miss Saigon there's a wonderful producer there his name um, is John Langridge and he used to put together various shows, um, songs from the shows where we'd go in and, and rehearse and record. And then he'd, he'd do these amazing um, big sort of staged concert versions of full musicals with what was then the concert, uh, the radio orchestra, beg your pardon, at the BBC. And the radio orchestra was a 70 odd piece, massive, brilliant orchestra and their rhythm section and their brass section. And it was sort of the strings and then the um, BBC big band. So, I mean, the top notch of everything. And then along with that, you also have the concert orchestra and you have the um, BBC symphony orchestra and all of that, you know, it was just absolutely amazing. And so I'd, I'd go in and do the, the sessions at, um, made a Vale Studios where, you know, I think Bing Crosby had done his last recording and we were in, you know, <laughs> which is, it, it's gone now in terms of being a recording shoot. It was beautiful, great big studios with wonderful Steinways and Bosendorfer pianos and this, this orchestra set up and you in a little, in a little booth in the room with them. So you'd record with the orchestra mm. live, you know, so that that feeling of actually making music together was was just amazing, and uh, and so I learned a lot by doing that because you had to you had to learn to to really listen, and of course you get such a support from being with an orchestra, and especially when an orchestra is on stage with you as they they were for for the concerts. It's one thing than being in a in a pit, mm. but that feeling of them surrounding you. And you that you know you that connection to the orchestra rather than singers and orchestra. You're all musicians together. It, it's glorious, and I and I feel sorry for people who who never get to experience that because I was so lucky and I did it such a lot. The experience of working with an orchestra is is just wonderful because you also have to work with a conductor, mm. and you the the collaboration is in you know what they want, how you'd like to sing something where you need to, to look at them. So the whole technique of, of learning to sing in that way, it's one thing doing it with just you and a piano, you know, you, you have that bond, but there's you and 70 people and that 70 people is being governed by a, um, a conductor who's also trying to honor what you'd like to do. And um, it's just a brilliant experience. And then you get this buoyancy, you know, you kind of feel you could sing anything when you've got a glorious orchestra, behind you what a great support of sound All yeah right. oh it, it is it is um yeah and and lovely people you know just being able to work together with so many lovely people and you know you kind of think at this time let's just hope that everybody's all right because it's so tough so tough for musicians as well <laughs> Um, you went on to play, uh, was it the alternate um, Anna in The King and I? Mm. Op yes. um, opposite Elaine Payne. I did, I did. It was that for me was a real joy as well. Um, when I was tiny little girl, I remember very clearly, I was five years old and I couldn't go to the bonfire party on our street. We lived on a, a cul-de-sac street um overlooking fields and my friend's dad 
was a fireman. And uh, so he always, we, we always had a bonfire because Ronnie always made sure that it was safe. So it was almost like a, a proper do, you know, kids yeah, were, you know, nobody was allowed to set their fireworks off. It was a real little street party. Everybody opened their garages and did the food and everything. And I wasn't able to go because I had chicken pox. <laughs> And so I just had to sit on the window seat in our bay window and, and watch it. And my mum said, um, oh, I'm, I'm going to put a record on. I'm going to put it so that you can enjoy. And, and she put on the soundtrack from the film of A King and I. And I think at that moment I was hooked. I think I probably spent two years playing all the Siamese children in the dance. <laughs> and, then, and then making myself voluminous skirts and dancing around and doing that so and and I became convinced that I was related to Anna because my great great grandma had a, a brooch which were um which I think had tiger's teeth because of course in those days people hunted I mean it's awful really but she had this tiger tooth brooch and I remember reading that um Mrs Anna's husband had killed a tiger and she'd had a tiger brooch. So I was convinced that I was actually <laughs> to Anna Leon Owens. I have no proof of that being a fact, I need to say. So if I ever do, um, who do you think you are? If we ever find that out, wouldn't that be a glorious thing? So, um, so that was just always something that I loved and not to mention what a glorious score. It's beautiful, it's beautiful. And uh, so I was approached actually to go and audition to play, um, oh, cracky, what's her name? Dee, 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 dee. Oh, oh. Lady oh. Tiang, Lady yeah, Tiang. Okay. Yes. So, so I was like, really? And, and I said to my agent, I really don't think I can be seen for Lady Tiang. But just, and I said very flippantly, but tell them that if Elaine wants um, an alternate, I'm your gal. So the next thing, the phone rings. <laughs> That's amazing. And so we'd really like to see you with the beauty coming to do it and um, be alternate to Elaine. We come and have a chat, which I did, and then found myself doing that, which was just lovely. I mean, two shows a week and then more, of course, because um, I think Elaine's mum was quite poorly when we were doing um, the show as well. So she had to take a bit of time off, which enabled me to go on a lot. And oh, it was just I mean what was it like wearing those costumes oh like my God, it was heavy that the, the shall we dance that the famous dress you know it's a bit like wearing a sofa it was really <laughs> really heavy and you're corseted up and you your whole body feels out of kilter because the weight shifts with the the weight of it um yeah they they were they were hard going actually really hard going but beautiful and once you you had to learn to move in the costumes, and that was something I learned very much from Maria Bjornsson, um, who designed Phantom, who was a, an extraordinarily talented and skilled craftswoman, really. She was brilliant with a wonderful eye. But when I went on that first time as Christine and she came, she said, oh, let me give you a tip. In the, in the negligee, she said, if you take bigger steps and you do this, she said, you, you will feel the costume feel the costume and and if you take bigger steps the costume will move in this way and that so she knew she knew everything and so because of that every time I wore a costume I think right okay what is this costume telling me to do because actually the costumes would dictate the movement of the period as well you know actually because if, if that's you know we, they were authentically made with properly boned corsets and the hoops and the you know, maybe the materials were slightly differently, but they were still made to those um, techniques. And um, and so really you, you had to allow the costume to dictate to you how you would move in it and stop trying to impose your modern ideas on it. And as soon as you give yourself over to, to that, it becomes easier. You find a way of finding the balance. You find a way of being able to sit down and move gracefully and, um, and when somebody's gone to the trouble of spending many, 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 many hours creating these beautiful things for yeah. you, you want to try and do justice to them, you know. But it doesn't stop you complaining because they were an absolute <laughs> pain in the neck and you just, you know, the number of massages you had to have. But you just, 
kept thinking, well, I'm so glad I live now. As, you get, in, as you get back into your jeans and T-shirt and, <laughs> yeah, and exactly. go home, you know. Yeah, but it was, it, I mean, the design of that was beautiful. Absolutely I, beautiful. I love the show. And I've done it's a lot a, of work with costumes, so I've got an appreciation for how... In what way? Work. What do you, do you sew? Yes, I do. It's actually something that I picked up myself. I taught myself how to do it. I wanted an extra skill, so I thought, why not learn? Do you sew from patterns and things? Are you? Yes, yeah. So I started off with, um, God, what's it called? McCall's patterns, and I, I made a Regency gentleman's coat. Um, Did you really? Which, yeah, I know. The, the first project, something so difficult to do. But Get yourself on sewing bee immediately. Oh, no. <laughs> I like to take my time. I think, like, that would be too... Oh, the pressure of that, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's incredible. But, yeah, so it gives you a real insight, doesn't it, into how these things Absolutely. are made. And, and actually, the structure of the clothes are the bits that you don't see, aren't they? You know, the... yeah, like with the corset, how did you find it affected your singing did, did it ever yeah, well, anything or was it it was all right actually you get used to them and the other thing about wearing a, a corset is eventually they mold into your shape um so i you you just get you get used to it and of course in in opera they they use corsets a lot anyway and it's and it can be quite useful to kind of to to help you with your support you know, there's not as much expansion, but usually they, when you're being fitted, you try and breathe so that you go, well, this is what, what I need, you know. Um, and also sometimes you get laced up in elastic rather than string, which just gives you, it doesn't give you that much give, but it can give you a bit. And, and in fact, in Phantom, one of the things that Maria did so brilliantly was she, she corseted all the costumes. So they were, you didn't have a separate corset. The costumes were all, oh, I mean, they, they were incredible. That's so useful, especially for quick changes or changes you've got, yeah. to, you know, yeah. <laughs> zero point <Yeah>. five seconds. <laughs> yeah, That's no, it was, it, it was. They were, they were stunning. But yeah, you just, you just get used to it. I mean, you just have to, don't you? It's weird. Let's have a little talk about um, your experience in Les Misérables. You played two parts from that show, I right? I did. I did. I was uh, Fontaine um, when the show was still at the Palace. So I think it was, was it 92, I played Fontaine, maybe. And then I went back to the show in 2005 to play Madame Thénardier at the Queen's Theatre, which I loved. I mean, there's one thing singing I Dreamed a Dream in that theatre, which is gorgeous. But I mean, oh, I had such a laugh with Madame Tenaggio. It's a probably the first time ever I didn't have to get up on a Monday and think, how's my voice? Am I going to be able to get through the week? What do I need to do to look at, you know, like, it doesn't matter if you sound rubbish and it doesn't matter what you look like, all good. <laughs> <laughs> and also I was working with Barry James again and who'd been my Seymour in, in Little Shop of Horrors. Amazing. So how joyful to be reunited with him. We had a real laugh doing that, it was great. I think that's what I enjoy about Les Mis. Like, it's those extremes of characters. Um, I mean, I, I love, like, Marius's stuff is so beautiful. It's so rich and yeah. you know, powerful. And then on the flip side, so, like, the character, you know, actor in you kind of goes, Tenardier, what a gift of, yeah, of, it is. of a part. Like, so, you know, there's ambitions there. Like, that would be a part for me at some point in future. I oh, good. Well, so let's, good. let's see to it that you do it. Yeah, <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's great. And also those characters are so big because they're so revolting and hideous. But the way that they're written to just offer some lightness in, in the piece as well, even though they, they are in a way the darkest characters oh, in, yeah. the show, in the show. But um, it, it's just so clever because, you know, it, it is a long piece, even with all the cuts and everything that happened now. And, and um, but just having them there and we just, honestly, we had, we had such a laugh. It's great. I bet. It, it's just, it's a great show. I love it. You know, and it's timeless. It just seems yeah. to live on and on and on. 
It is. It is. I, I, and I, I enjoyed both my experiences. I really did. But I think if I had to call it, I'd Madam T every time. I can oh. think I can think I dreamed a dream in a concert. That's fine, because that's yeah. pretty much all you do, really. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I get, and then but Madam T, you're just popping up. And every time you pop up, you look even more awful than you did the time before. Those wigs, I, I just loved it. I had such a great time. So you also have been a vocal coach to a couple of TV programmes that which yeah. are quite well known. Could you talk to us a little bit about those? Yes, I, I was one of the vocal coaches on the um, hunt for the uh, Nancy and the Oliver, the I Do Anything, which was to find one of each for the, the show that was then produced and performed at Drury Lane that Jodie Prenger won in the end right. uh so i was one of the vocal coaches on that which was brilliant and i was also one of the vocal coaches on the next one that they did which was the over the rainbow to find uh the dorothy right. for the um for the wizard of oz for the andrew lloyd webber production of the wizard of oz and then also did a couple of series of pop star to opera star as well which was great and done a few other things but those are the two that um i did the most work on really and and it was brilliant because for for all of us who were working on that show, you know, finding new talent and giving those people a, a chance, it sounds like it was an easy option for them. You know, the instant stardom thing, let me tell you, nothing could be further than the truth because you have to learn so much so quickly. You've got the cameras poking around up your nose for the or every hour of the day and with the children as well you have to be particularly careful because at the end of the day there were young boys yeah you know and you have to be careful how you let them down you know they know they know they're in a competition that somebody goes home which is fine in theory but the practicalities of that is that if it's you it's awful and um yeah. oh, so you know you have a real duty of care and um i'm so pleased that that they've all done so well and in fact one of our little Oliver's Jordan Lee Kim is is um a musical director now doing wonderful things with How amazing yeah yeah lovely little Jordan and he was emptying something for the National Youth Music Theatre actually and my daughter was involved in it she said Jordan's desperate to meet you and I have it's Jordan and then she said do you not remember and I'm like, oh my god he's a man <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and doing doing great things yeah and and all the girls you know they, they, especially with, I think for the Dorothy girls that was even harder because they were younger mm -hmm. and then you know a lot of them went on to um performing arts colleges and had quite a hard time they had to really prove themselves and they have you know and um we had a we had a, a little reunion zoom party um in the first lockdown all of us because it was their 10th anniversary oh wow yeah i know and i'm still in touch with some of the girls from um uh from i i do anything you know i see jody whenever i can I've not seen her for a bit but um jesse still in touch with and um always lovely to bump into samantha i see rachel occasionally um so it was it was great and it was really lovely for us to be part of them and help them I mean, let's face it they all they all came in with the tools to start with you know yeah. my heart goes out to oliver really it's a show that you know really launched me i played oliver at the leicester haymarket did you it was yes and how old were you i was 10. <laughs> are you really so it was 99 to 2000 um and our nancy was lindsay Haitley. Oh, I was speaking to Lindsay yesterday. I'll have to tell her. I didn't yeah. know any of this. And then she she stopped doing it. The understudy took over for a short time. And then Sally Ann Triplett took over. And our Fagin was Julian Forsyth. Oh, really? Yeah. So I mean, that was that was my first step into the professional world. And that was eye-opening for me, like watching all these amazing people at work. And you know, I really I made sure that I did watch them and took on all of the stuff that, you know, they were doing. And I was inspired 
to up my game because of how well they were performing. I mean, yeah, how amazing. But I mean, it's a massive responsibility for, for a little boy, isn't it, really? At the time, I, I kind of, I don't know. I just went with it. You just do, don't you? I, yeah, I guess. You, you get wrapped up in this whole sort of, like, okay, well, I've just got to do it. In some ways, I think I was a little bit like a rabbit in headlights thinking, wow, look at these amazing people. Like, what am I doing here? But, um, you know, it was so extraordinary to be able to get on that big stage. And uh, my parents, I remember them saying, like, as soon as I came out to sing Where Is Love, they they literally were just like, <laughs> you know, it was like grip onto the seat moment. I bet, I bet. But, oh, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. I mean, it's so gorgeous show and of course I played Nancy at, at the Palladium um in between yeah in between Sally Dexter and, and Ruthie Henschel they suddenly realized that they had a bit of a gap and I got a phone call from you know Cameron's office going oh you can play Nancy for a bit I just, <laughs> I just had my son I was like okay when he went well we started rehearsals last week so okay so I went and did 12 weeks of, of Nancy and having a a, a lovely time in that production oh, really so that was really special to me when we were working on that you know because having played the role as well I I, I really it, it's tough you know Nancy's a it's a tough role in a way because it's so it's so hard on you on your voice because you're on the front foot all the time you know yeah. and um oh no it was it was it was gorgeous it was gorgeous doing both playing the role and then looking after the girls and the boys yeah so I I thoroughly enjoyed that I, I love the the coaching aspect of, of what I do anyway and and um you know at the moment it's very difficult because a, a lot of students are really struggling so at the moment I'm doing quite a lot more counseling than teaching in a way right. and just say to them you know if you don't feel like singing just give yourself a pat on the back for getting through from day to day it's it's fine Definitely. You know, it's 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 very tough for performing arts students right now. Um, you know, the people who graduated two years ago will be finding it would have been finding it difficult. And then, of course, there's last year and now and now this year. And it will it will all come right. It will all come right. But it's, it's tough if you're in that in the thick of it right now and the vortex of, of the what the heck is, is going to happen. But uh, yeah, so I, I loved those. And it's a shame there aren't there aren't more um I really really enjoyed it and you know you learn it's like you were saying earlier on about learning as you go along you know I I learn just as much from my students as, as they learn from me because like, I'm really enjoying this it's so good yeah like, well me too it's just so lovely to chat to you it really I'll hear more about what you've been up to <laughs> Any parts that you wish you could have played or that you would still like to go on and play? Um, oh yeah, the too much too many to to count really. But I think as I've got older, I would love to have a crack at gypsy. I'd love to have a crack at mame, and I'd also love to play the mum in the lighting the piazza. I think that I three quite different shows but yeah I'd love love those what would I have liked to have done well I suppose you know the the more modern musicals that have, have come up that I'm you know 40 years too old for um and I'd love to have played Mary Poppins actually because I did the very very first demo of that so I was the first person ever in the whole wide world apart from George to sing Practically Perfect but I was already I was already too old even then so right. that that would have been lovely um but I'm quite happy with what I've done. But as I, as getting older, you know, those are the roles. But of course, and the Hilda's doing them all. What can we do? Somebody <laughs> lock her in a wardrobe and never let her out. That's what needs to happen. Um, but yeah, the, I think those are the three that that spring instantly to mind. Oh, and I suppose also, um, uh, what's in it? Mrs. Lovett, Sweeney Todd. Hey, look, look, I'm perfect. Perfect for oh, it. No. And actually, <laughs> let's just let's just note uh, your hair at the minute. Like, what a glorious <laughs> colour that is! I tell you something. My mum, as soon as she watches this, she'll be she'll be down the chemist. She'll get herself like get <laughs> and. Not in touch with me. I'll tell you what. Well, uh, the reason this came about, of course, like like so many of us, going lockdown fever. 
and then everything being closed and not being able to go to the hairdressers and my grey roots and all my other roots and going, well, OK. Um, so I just put a sort of semi-permanent washouty pink rinse because I thought, why not? I'll, I'll keep this while we're in lockdown, thinking it would probably be a couple of months. And now I'm, I'm just kind of keeping with it because as far, until we come out of this, I'm keeping the pink hair. And I might then carry on forever. Oh, Who knows? I love it. But, it's so <laughs> <laughs> so it just I just figured it's better than the grey. That that's really all. That was all. That's what wigs are for, right? Exactly. <laughs> so this is this is Miss Moore's lockdown fever hairdo. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Um, okay, as you know, this is a very uncertain time for theatre, but we're confident that we will rise from the ashes and that there will be, in effect, a renaissance of theatre. What words of encouragement could you give to those going into the business now and those thinking about going into the business? I think what I would say is remember why you do it. I think those of us, when we're little, and that's when we usually start finding the love and we're romping around the kitchen or the house, singing along to our favourite Disney or music songs or whatever it might be. At no point when, when you're doing that do you think one day... I'm going to do this for a living. You do it because you love it and it makes you feel amazing. And it's difficult to keep sight of that. And, and it's okay not to feel amazing right now as well. But, you know, it's always been a dodgy profession in terms of security. So if you, if you feel that you love it, then pursue it because you only regret the things you've not done and wish you had. And, uh, and, it will be okay and it is going to be tough but there there are ways forward and um you know i think you've just got to follow your heart you've got to follow your heart and have a go and um and you know because of of the next generations coming through will ensure that there is a future for musical theater for all theater and music so you know uh, it, it will be your time that's what i would say Great. That's Through the Roof Theatre will be specialising in producing shows that aren't particularly well known to a wider audience. Um, are there any shows that you have done that you would consider to be a hidden gem or something that we as a company could look at putting on in future? Yeah, I did a show at the German Street Theatre in 1998 and it was called The Betrayal of Nora Blake which was a sort of film noir musical. And it was just, it was written by a, a guy called John Mayer, who I think had worked with Judy Garland in her later years, who wrote this uh, amazingly bluesy score. We just had piano and sax, because in the German Street Theatre, it only seats about 70 people. Yeah. Uh, I played a, one of a pair of twins, Izzy Van Randwick played my twin sister. And it was a sort of murder mystery film noir musical. It was directed by um, Nicholas Grace. And it, it, that was beautiful and the, the songs in that. And it, it, I think if it had been done later, I remember one of the reviews said, you know, I hope a, a producer will take a chance on this because it, it deserves a run in the West End. And, it, you know, even though it was just not the right time, I guess. And that was a really, really special few weeks couple of months or whatever it was that we did it for it was a brilliantly conceived very funny it was hilariously funny um you know and a budget of tuppence and that was a brilliant piece and I'd never done anything in such a tiny space either where you have to practically stare people <laughs> and make sure you didn't trip over their feet so that that was the the one for me that in a way the show that got away not so much for me but the show that got away as a show and and deserved more life it was it's brilliant small company you know in, in a sort of um same sort of size as a, a little shop company very much an ensemble company that that was brilliant and then of course the other show that I was involved in that I loved which didn't really get away and wasn't so much a hidden gem but was London Road which was such an extraordinary wow. piece of musical theatre in an experimental way not necessarily going to grab your commercial audience in a sense but but as a piece of theatre, that was a remarkable bit of work. And I think probably 
probably will probably be my, one of my favourites of all time, actually. That would be something for us to research then. Oh, yes. Verbatim theatre. Have fun with that, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So, Claire, we've got a couple of fan questions that, if you wouldn't mind answering. Thrilled. Thank you for being fans. I love you, whoever you are. When I'm performing in a show, I like to keep a bag of sweets in my dressing room as a mid-show snack. Are there any treats that you like to keep in your dressing room? Oh, well, uh, what do I keep as a treat in my dressing room? Well, if I'm being honest, I would say there's always a bottle of fizz in the fridge. <laughs> not necessarily the end of every show, but <laughs> and, certainly, and certainly not for during. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, and, and so I don't, I don't sort of tend to nibble too much during the show, but that that might a, a little glass of something sparkling that isn't lemonade will will often be waiting at the end of the show for a, in the dressing room. So there's always a bottle, at least one bottle in the fridge. Oh, perfect girl after my own heart. I have <laughs> to say, one of my favourite parts of Phantom is when the chandeliers cut down. What was it like to see that swing towards you each night? Um, yeah, that that's a really good question. It it was always quite thrilling. I always knew we were safe, but the audience, it was the audience reaction, especially in the very early days, when they felt, oh my God, is it actually going to hit my head? And in fact, on one particular show, one of the wires did break and they don't know how lucky they were because it missed it missed the people in the stalls by about that much. So that was a genuine, um, oh my word, what is going to happen? <laughs> but it was, it was brilliant when it came down because it did move quite quickly. Um, and it was heavy and we always had the, the crew waiting to catch it. So you always felt safe, really. Right. But, you know, you wouldn't have wanted to kind of miss your footing or anything. But it was the, the reaction of the audience that made that work so brilliantly. Because they'd never seen anything like it in the, in the early days. Hi, Claire. Do you have a staple song that you like to sing on auditions? And if you do, what do you sing? Wow. Well, do I suppose I've probably... <laughs> I'm one of those people, I'm probably a bit mad actually, that I often will learn a new song for auditions and then wonder why I've done that. Because you just think, why don't you just sing something you really know? Because I often think, well, like, that might suit for an audition, I'll do that. And I suppose also then I, it, it gives me a bit of a, a thrill to see if I can get, get through. Um, but I suppose, what would I, I mean, my, my, my sort of um, pop songy audition thing was, as I said, you know, a, a choice of one of three probably from the 1976 The Star Is Born, which is just such a brilliant score. So if in doubt, I'll whip one of those out. And if I'm doing something a bit more legit, either probably go to a Rodgers and Hammerstein or Rodgers and Hart. What are your top tips for maintaining good vocal health and stamina? Warming up regular singing because it's a muscle so you need to keep using it i mean i'm a right one to talk at the moment because i mean probably through lockdown i've sat down and not sung more than i ever have in my entire life but <laughs> um but generally speaking you know just and rest when you need to but just make sure you don't you've got to keep it keep it well oiled and, and singing will just make it stronger you don't have to push yourself you know don't don't push the extremes but just sing in your comfortable voice and just keep it keep it used and and if you're not well then you need to make sure that you rest then you know there's a difference between being a bit tired and actually not being well and I know it's not always possible sometimes you've got to sing on it when when you're not well but in an ideal world you, you just got to look after yourself a bit of steaming um try not to eat too late if you're you know and acidy foods and all of those things and I think if you are struggling with your voice and you don't think you're ill, do check your diet because quite often you can get a kind of acid reflux in the night that you're not even aware of and, and you think, you know, uh, and it can give you a hoarseness that you might not be aware of. So check, check that um, and just, you know, keep singing and enjoying it and, you know, don't, don't push yourself. <laughs> Thank you, Claire, for talking to us today. It's been absolutely amazing. Um, oh, well, uh, it's been my pleasure, honestly, Aaron. It's, it's, it's so lovely. It's so lovely to know that there's a world out there as well and that, that musical theatre still 
has a place. It, it, it's been really great for me, I must say. Absolutely. Onwards and upwards, I say. Absolutely. Um, so I guess one of the questions is, would you consider visiting us when we can and coming and doing some workshops with us? Oh, I don't know about that. To... Yeah, of course, I'd absolutely love to. I'd absolutely love to. So uh, just count me in and I'll be there as soon as we can. Won't that be a joy? Yeah, that's brilliant. Claire, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. And thanks to everybody as well for listening. And those of you who ask questions, it's just lovely to know you're out there. And good luck to everybody. Awesome. All right, then. Thank you, Claire. Oh, thanks, Aaron. Yeah.